Hey everyone, it's time for another installment in this series exposing all the frauds at Discovery Institute, the Christian propaganda mill whose sole purpose is to lie about science for Jesus. What have they been up to lately? Well, at this point, the DI might as well change their name to the Dave Farina is a Stupid Jerkface Institute because most of their written output is just damage control pieces whining about how mean I am. In fact, the last two installments in this series have simply been responses to Gunter Beckley desperately trying to neutralize my devastating debunks of Casey Luskin and Stephen Meyer. Well, the third part of the series is on Michael Behe, and this time the assignment was given to bottom-tier errand boy Jonathan McLatchy, a pointless tool who would normally be ignored, but he had to go and mouth off about me, so let's humiliate him. It won't take too long since he's done essentially nothing noteworthy whatsoever. He doesn't have popular books full of lies to comb through like Meyer or Behe, so let's just get some background information and then tear through his pathetic blog posts about my Behe debunk. First, let's check out his website. On the About page, we see that he has several degrees, including a doctorate in evolutionary biology. Hmm, what was his thesis about? Well, it's pretty hard to find, but I tracked it down on the website for his institution. However, it is not clickable or readable as no electronic copy exists, which absolutely is not normal, so its quality or why it's unavailable are a mystery. Then I went to Google Scholar. This first result about varicose veins is from 1928, so I don't think it's him. After that, there's a rant about the evils of pornography, and then links to his garbage blog posts on Evolution News. There's this citation that's also not clickable, but I search the title and his name is nowhere on it. That's it. End of list. So it doesn't seem like he's ever published anything, nor is there a shred of evidence for him ever having actually done any science of any kind. This is not a surprise because back on his bio, under research interests, he lists intelligent design, which is not science, and a bunch of Bible stuff, which is not science. So he is not a scientist, has never published any science, and just got some degrees to seem more credible in his attempts to deny science. This is further confirmed by looking at this list of public debates and conversations. Again, 100% Jesus stuff. He has never contributed anything to the field of biology, he just lies about it on the internet. But wait, he was an assistant professor of biology? That has to count for something, right? Hmm, what's Sattler College? Oh, equipping Jesus' peaceful revolution. That's not a good sign. As it turns out, the whole school has 73 students and only five majors, and is located on the 17th floor of this high-rise office building, which has no laboratories or scientific equipment of any kind. But don't worry, they do have spaghetti and marshmallows. So, it's basically not so much a real college, but more of a cash grab that extends homeschooling for brainwashed Christians into college age. That makes this a fake title meant to boost his credibility. What's even funnier is that he refers to himself on Twitter as resident biologist at Discovery Institute. Doing a lot of biology research over there, Johnny? Is Meyer going to buy you the newest big boy science kit for Christmas? I heard it has plastic test tubes and food coloring. When are we going to see some of this biology research published in a real science journal for grown-ups? Don't worry, I won't hold my breath. Anyway, as you can see from his YouTube output, the guy is just a garden variety Christian apologist. Resurrection of Jesus, whining about atheists, trying to disprove Islam, and so forth. That's the main reason there won't be too much to say here. I'm not going to do an hour-long debunk on someone claiming that Harry Potter is real. It's a book. Johnny also has a book of stories that he thinks are real. They aren't and it's neither interesting nor worth my time to dwell on it. I'm a man of science, so I expose people who lie about science. But for the record, plenty of people have humiliated Johnny on religion, too. One time he was debating Matt Dillahunty about evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, but since there is none, and it definitely did not happen, Matt was pummeling him so hard that he had to rage quit and go cry in the corner. Now, are you just going to say that for all those other religions or for those other supernatural accounts, you just don't find those people truthful? Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, then I don't find yours truthful, and there's no point in having a debate because we no longer give a damn about epistemology. We're just going to go with how our gut feels, right? 
Well, we're going to look at the evidence. And when I, I've been asking for evidence. Do you have any evidence that doesn't come from the Bible? No. Okay. So, so you, you have nothing but a hearsay account from an unidentifiable source. We have evidence from the New Testament, including Paul and the Gospels and so forth. Yeah. So why don't you start responding to the evidence rather than just dismissing it? It's not evidence. It's claims, not evidence. There is no evidence. There is no physical evidence. There is no... Uh, what you can do is you can say that there are people who wrote stories and you find them compel compelling and okay. I don't. If you're, if you're just going to keep dismissing the evidence, then we're done. Yes, we are. We, we are. And you know whose fault it is? The God that you believe in, because the God that you believe in is too stupid to understand right. that when he presents something in a way where it's indistinguishable from other things that are false, that's the end of the conversation. Yeah. I didn't make yeah. up the rules about what counts as evidence. Oh, did he just leave? No, I don't. I mean, he's definitely not here, but I don't know. if I, don't I heard him say we're done. Johnny doesn't like it when adults tell him that his special stories aren't real. Here's another embarrassing incident where Johnny tried to mouth off to biologist P.Z. Myers in a live Q&A. It's a long, pathetic interaction, so I won't play the whole thing, but it's linked below, and essentially consists of Johnny repeatedly saying, how come this thing that isn't true, and Myers unabashedly dumping all over him. Um, I was wondering if you would perhaps comment um, on the sheer lack of correlation or congruence uh, between homology and developmental pathways. I can give you several examples of that. Um, I, I, I can... Um... Well, for, for, first let me ask you a question. Aren't you a little bit of a shame to have been responsible for this bullshit? <laughs> no, I'm serious. No. <laughs> the first answer is simply that the question is bullshit. Uh, that the, this isn't a real question. Genetic circuitry that underlies the formation of the neural tube in its early stages is homologous between Drosophila and mice. Um, maybe so, but... Um, they, they form... Maybe so, but that completely invalidates your question. <laughs> you're, you're asking me to explain how they're different, and I just told you that they're not different. They're the same. This is how most creationists operate. They just make claims that are objectively false, get dunked on for saying false things, pretend it didn't happen, and repeat the same lies forever. All of Johnny's content is like this. Here's a blog post talking about the irreducible complexity of sperm cells, focusing largely on the flagellum and how no sperm cell can function without one. Of course, to those who care about facts, it won't be a surprise that sperm without flagella currently exist and do just fine. It's very well documented and also well explained in the literature. In species that are monandrous, meaning having one sexual partner, sperm competition is lessened and there is no selective pressure for sperm motility, so plenty of species have sperm that have lost their flagella given the lower energy expenditure. This has been told to Johnny multiple times, and certainly prior to him writing this very recent blog post, but he just keeps spinning the same lies over and over again. I think creationists are hopelessly obsessed with the flagellum because it reminds them of flagellation, since they regularly whip themselves for sexual gratification as they're too bashful to masturbate in front of the eyes of the Lord. Anyway, let's get to the meat of it. Johnny stretched his tantrum about my Behe debunk into four separate blog posts. So let's start with the first one, where he tries to defend irreducible complexity, and it's comedy gold right from the first sentence. On the internet, some people are worth responding to, and others are not. The implication being that I'm not worth responding to. Despite the fact that half the DI staff publish hit pieces on me weekly, and here are several more. So, that was a really dumb way to start. Anyway, on to the SIT Plus mutant, which many of you will recall was something that arose in the Lensky long-term evolution experiment on E. coli. A particular strain evolved an attribute that qualifies as irreducibly complex according to Behe's own definition, just another in a long list of examples that shatters the DI's whole evolution-doesn't-make-anything-cool approach to science denial. Remember, Behe says that something is irreducibly complex if it consists of several components which together produce a function such that the removal of any single component leads to the failure of that function. 
This experiment produced a strain of bacteria that was able to digest citrate in an aerobic environment. And in order to do this, it required multiple mutations in both the DCTA gene and the CIT-T gene, and a duplication of the CIT-T gene into a new region of the genome. All of these changes were required, and none of them can have been selected for individually. In fact, the critical duplication is actually deleterious on its own without the other mutations. So according to Behe's own definition, it is irreducibly complex, yet we watched it evolve. How is Johnny going to deal with this one? Surprise, surprise, he lies. He pretends that the only change was duplication of the CIT-T gene, a relatively simple change that does not require multiple codependent mutations to bring it about. Except it does, Johnny. It specifically does require that. Remember when I said that with crystal clarity in my video? Should we check the literature to really prove what a lying fraud you are? The first paper that demonstrated the complexity of the CIT plus trait was A Case Study in Evolutionary Contingency by Zachary Blount, published in 2016, which showed that additional mutations occurred in the history of the CIT plus line that allowed the CIT plus trait to actually occur. But ironically, as we mentioned in the Behe debunk, a lot of the details of the CIT plus trait were fleshed out in another 2016 paper called Rapid Evolution of Citrate Utilization by Escherichia coli by Direct Selection Requires CIT-T and DCTA, co-authored by one of Johnny's DI colleagues, Scott Minich. In this paper, Minich and his co-authors identified a set of specific mutations that are necessary for the CIT plus trait to evolve. Minich and other DI hacks tout this study to try and undercut the weight of what the LTEE demonstrated, claiming, hey, it's actually really easy to evolve CIT plus under the right conditions, so it's no big deal. When what they've actually done is show just how readily irreducibly complex traits can evolve, completely demolishing the biggest argument in their pathetic arsenal. He even references the Minich paper only to completely contradict himself, outright stating that three steps were highlighted, the first involving neutral mutations which are necessary for the later actualization event. That's how confident he is that nobody reading has a clue what he's talking about. The self-contradiction is blatant. So when you pretend that it was just a duplication of the CIT-T gene and nothing else, that's called a lie. You know, those things that liars tell? You're a liar, Johnny, like every other loser apologist. You tell a lie, and then you spew a bunch of irrelevant information to sound intelligent, so that the reader assumes you're right. That E. coli could already metabolize citrate under anaerobic conditions is irrelevant. The new phenotype is irreducibly complex. Then he pivots to the same old script about how mutations are destructive. This is profoundly idiotic and dishonest, since we've documented plenty of non-destructive mutations. These are mutations where the organism benefits in some way without any cost or loss of function. Again, the CIT plus trait is one such example, since the original CIT-T gene is still there, doing its regular anaerobic job, unperturbed by the new function conferred by the duplicated gene. Even idiots like Johnny are capable of understanding this, which proves they are lying about it. Another example I mentioned in the Behe debunk is the VPU protein in HIV-1. It evolved the ability to counteract part of the human immune system that's different from other apes, a completely new function, without losing its ancestral function. Johnny attempts damage control here, too. First, he references a completely different paper which investigates only one region of the protein instead of the paper I referenced, which investigates two regions, specifying that adaptations in both of these regions are required for the novel activity. The paper Johnny pivoted to examines only one of these, creationist cherry-picking at its finest. It's also worth noting that another study looking at a different HIV subgroup, HIV-1N, showed four amino acid substitutions that activated VPU against human tetherin, which are totally different from the ones in the study on HIV-1M. 
So this example also debunks another classic creationist straw man, the idea that there is only one way to get a particular function. Two different sets of mutations yielding the same novel function in two different subgroups of the virus. Isn't it lovely when one example debunks two creationist talking points at the same time? After that, Johnny decides to whine about how none of it matters and this example doesn't count because it's in viruses, which mutate so rapidly. No fair. Okay then, moron. How about an example from humans? Lactase persistence, the ability to digest lactose throughout adulthood, has evolved many times independently across different human cultures. Almost all of the responsible mutations are within an intron of the MCM6 gene, which is just upstream of the lactase gene that codes for the enzyme required to digest lactose. Those mutations are in an enhancer for that lactase gene, so they increase its level of expression throughout adulthood. Nothing is broken, nothing is lost, and there are no costs to these mutations. They just allow you to make lactase as an adult and thus digest lactose. So as you can see, it's the same old bullshit script with no attention paid to all of the work that directly contradicts what he's saying. Pathetic. Let's move on to part two, which is about the bacterial flagellum, the honorary mascot of intelligent design. He starts by whining about how I identified the persistent tactic of using terminology related to man-made machines to describe biological systems to manipulate the viewer into believing these systems were designed. Predictably, Johnny says that everyone talks like this. Not really, though. People who aren't pushing propaganda typically refer to these structures by saying acts as a drive shaft or molecular clutch using quotation marks to distinguish from a literal clutch. The functions are analogous. There have been numerous papers written to push back against this analogy of cells as machines or organisms as machines, which is not as ideal as many people think. But they don't want to lose this tactic, so they have to pretend they aren't being manipulative. But here's the big whiff for this one. I had taken Behe to school for a paper he wrote with David Snoke where he pretended that his simulation demonstrated the improbability of irreducibly complex traits arising. Here's Johnny's response. Finally, Farina complains that they also specified a predetermined target sequence and only considered the simulation to have been successful if that specific target evolved. But this is incorrect. Rather, the paper provides estimates for how many organisms would be required and over how long a time frame for multiple codependent mutations, none of which by themselves confers an advantage, to become fixed in a population. See what he does there? He states the critique and then says something completely irrelevant. His response does not in any way address the critique. Nobody cares how many organisms and how long it took. That does not refute what I said. It is objectively true that Behe and Snoke specified a target sequence, something that Johnny doesn't even try to dispute, and that alone invalidates their conclusion, since evolution does not work that way. There are no predetermined goal sequences. Nature is not sentient. We have directly experimentally demonstrated that there are usually many sequences that will do a specific job approximately equally well. For example, a 2018 study found that among random strings of 100 nucleotides, many will function as a promoter in E. coli, some equally as well or even better than the wild type sequence. So setting a predetermined target to determine how fast or slow or how likely or unlikely something is to evolve completely invalidates whatever conclusion you reach, period. Johnny spews irrelevant tripe to distract from the fact that he is perpetuating the same old script of lies while pretending that he's addressing anything I said and failing miserably. Moving on to number three, we go from Behe's first garbage book, Darwin's Black Box, to his second garbage book, The Edge of Evolution, and Johnny doesn't do any better here. Remember that tactic from a minute ago where he just repeats the critique and then follows it with something completely unrelated? He does that again here. He quotes my explanation for how Behe butchers the concept of fitness landscapes and then responds with this. 
but for many complex adaptations, such as those described in Behe's books, a fitness benefit is not realized until multiple codependent mutations have arisen. That is exactly what both Behe and Johnny get wrong about this. That sentence is only true if the fitness landscape doesn't change. For example, if a mutation makes an enzyme less stable, then it may become compatible with different substrates, since its structure will be more flexible. In an environment with only one target molecule, this would then be harmful. But if a second target becomes available, meaning if the fitness landscape changes, then that mutation may be beneficial under the new conditions. Pretty easy to grasp, huh? Just a quick reminder, Johnny has a doctorate in evolutionary biology. There's no way he doesn't understand this. He's shilling for the DI for cash. He ends this installment with a section on HIV, saying, Farina takes issue with Behe's claims concerning HIV that there have been no significant basic biological changes in the virus at all, and there have been no reports of new viral protein-protein interactions developing in an infected cell due to mutations in HIV proteins. He cites the VPU example discussed in Part 1. However, as Behe acknowledged years ago, this was one example he had overlooked in The Edge of Evolution. Nonetheless, it does not significantly impact the thesis of the book, since the statement may be modified to assert that, there have been hardly any reports of new viral protein-protein interactions developing in an infected cell due to mutations in HIV proteins. It's actually pretty great that he admits this, because the difference between none and hardly any is the difference between Behe being right and Behe being full of shit. It's the difference between evolution being impossible, like the DI wants their audience to think, and evolution working exactly the way evolutionary biology says it does. Shocking. Finally, we get to the fourth one, which is about Behe's third and arguably dumbest book, Darwin Devolves. This is the one that botches super basic concepts in genetics so badly that it becomes painfully obvious that Behe is lying, since nobody that passed freshman year Biology 101 would say things as stupid as what's in this book. As you may recall, the entire book is based on the singular insane lie that mutations degrade information in the genome and are somehow destructive. Of course, this is meaningless and simply meant to take advantage of people who have no idea what mutation means or even what DNA is. Even with simple point mutations, which don't degrade anything, they just potentially alter the products of gene expression. The results are varied. But more importantly, there are large-scale mutations that I mentioned in the Behe debunk, like gene duplication and neofunctionalization, as well as de novo genes, which produce completely new proteins without losing any genetic material or existing functionality. Every biology undergraduate student in the world knows this. Let's see how little Johnny tries to play it off. First, he tries to cover up the fact that Behe himself provided a counterexample to his own thesis with the C. Harlem variant of hemoglobin, and this mess is how he tries to do that. Surprisingly, however, the C. Harlem gene, which builds directly on the foundation of the sickle gene and would entirely eliminate the drawbacks of the sickle mutation, has not yet turned up in Africa, where it would do the most good. The reason for this is that the move from regular hemoglobin to C. Harlem would require two codependent mutations, whereas the sickle cell trait requires only one. Again, we see Johnny's strategy of ignore the critique and say something unrelated, which almost always turns out to be some variant of, but it's really unlikely. That doesn't matter. Behe's whole argument is based on the idea that non-reductive beneficial traits never evolve. But here we have an example of such a trait that he himself described in his book. How frequently we expect it to evolve is completely irrelevant to the question of whether it exists. And if we want to take this non-response seriously, it clearly evolved at least once since we've documented its existence. 
Then he whines about Sit Plus again and says literally nothing. He claims he already addressed this earlier, but of course that was in a completely different and unrelated context concerning irreducible complexity. It was also full of lies, but it doesn't matter, it was a different topic. He genuinely just points at him having mentioned Sit Plus before, and that's that. How about for Darwin Devolves, Johnny? Where are the deleterious mutations for the Sit Plus mutants, huh? Oh, B. He talks about it in his book Full of Lies, so it should be pretty easy for you to summarize what he said, right? No? Just move along knowing that none of the readers care? Yeah. Then he mentions de novo genes and again says literally nothing. This paragraph doesn't even have a point for me to refute. Then he whines about no convincing mechanistic scenario by which non-coding DNA may be transformed into genes coding for proteins that are ready to fulfill a functional role. Um, it's called evolution, moron. New gene, new protein, mutations occur, and if a useful function arises, it's selected for. And of course, he doesn't even bother trying to discuss gene duplication because he has nothing to say about it. A gene is copied, so there are two of them. One stays the same to maintain the original function, and the other changes to potentially yield a new function. There is nothing destructive about that. A child could understand this, so he ignores it. Then we get to my favorite part, the one where I really, really caught Behe with his pants down by exposing him doctoring data to lie about a publication. This is the polar bear bit. Remember, in my debunk, I showed the real data table from the supplemental section of the paper Behe was lying about, and then I showed what he displayed on Evolution News. Behe is telling the lie that mutations are always damaging, so instead of showing the actual data table, he makes his own version and chops out the data he doesn't like, which is two whole columns and every single row that says benign. This makes Behe a lying fraud, objectively. You don't have to understand an ounce of science to see that. How's Johnny gonna spin this one? Oh, of course, the table was so super big, so it made more sense to only show the data that supports what Behe was saying, and not the parts that contradict what he's saying, and also not tell the reader that he did that, because there's not enough room on the internet to show a data table. Seriously, that's how this moron decides to defend this act. Nothing duplicitous, he says. He then goes on to restate Behe's thesis, a term used very liberally since it's actually just a lie, and smugly wraps things up. Dave is a dumb liar because I say so, and other people have also corrected our lies, and we have done damage control on those people too, so Dave is just a stupid doo-doo head. Immaculate. For the cherry on top, Johnny decided to write a blog post exclusively about a Twitter interaction we had, calling it a debate and doing more of what these bozos do best, whining about how mean I am. But of course, he has to pretend that he won a point somehow, so what does he do? He strings together interactions from different days on totally different threads to present the illusion of a single continuous conversation to pretend that he asked me questions I couldn't answer. For a while, it's just me taking a big dump on him since he's a lying fraud who works for a vicious propaganda mill, and he absolutely deserves to be spoken to this way, given all the slander directed at me. But let's jump down to the important part. He asks a question and then types crickets over and over again, as though I heard him and can't answer. Now let's visit reality. Here's the first tweet on June 27th. Then we immediately jump to another thread, a quote tweet from that day. Then we time travel to June 26th and visit someone else's thread where he responded to me and we get the next few entries. Then we jump to another thread where he milks it all for attention and my response. And then over to yet another thread where he wants to keep things going. He gives up here but feels the need to milk it again with another tweet of his own, so I dunk on him, and from my perspective that was the end of the interaction. There were three people who replied to what I said to laugh with me at how pathetic Johnny is, and that's all she wrote. 
Then for the crickets bit, look at what he does. He jumps all the way back to this much earlier thread and begins replying there again a full two days later, posting several times that day and the next, sometimes tagging me, but I was clearly not notified. And on July 1st, he declares himself victorious in this conversation with himself. Then for this last bit, he decides to time travel back to June 28th for his tweet about the fourth blog post, tack that on there as the closer, and pretend that was me chiming back in to resume conversation. Can you imagine being this aggressively pathetic that you have to fabricate an entire conversation by stitching together tweets from a dozen different threads completely out of order, just to convince your loser followers that you're winning something? It's like he's concocted some kind of fan fiction revenge porn, muttering, take that, you stupid jerk, as he furiously types away in his mom's basement, and then decides to publish it as actual content. It's the saddest thing I've ever seen. I mean, the DI is nothing but losers top to bottom, but this is so sad that it almost makes you pity the guy. Anyway, that about does it for Jonathan McClatchy, another fraud on the payroll of a prominent Christian propaganda mill doing what he does best, lying for Jesus. I've exposed these clowns so badly that even their flock is starting to notice, so this is the best they can do. Write some lies for a blog so that the people who will never watch my content have something to point at, read none of it, and conclude that I've somehow been dealt with. So that's it for today. Stick to coffee runs for the higher-ups, Johnny. You do not have a talent for this. And to Meyer and Pals, I've got a bunch more of these coming, so good luck with the next wave of desperate damage control. You may want to find a new angle. Whining about how mean I am is getting a little stale. To everyone else, I'll see you next time.